Okay, this is video number three. Acute renal failure may be pre-renal, intra-renal, or post-renal. Each type of renal failure is produced by a problem in a different part of the renal system. In pre-renal failure, blood flow to the kidneys is reduced or interrupted. This typically occurs when cardiac output falls below normal, such as in heart failure. When blood flow is reduced, the kidneys try to compensate by releasing renin. This hormone triggers the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II in the lungs and kidneys, and the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. Together, these substances constrict the arteries and raise intravascular volume, which raises the blood pressure and improves blood flow to the kidneys. However, if this compensation isn't sufficient, blood flow to the kidneys eventually decreases and may cause ischemia. When blood flow is decreased, the glomeruli can't filter blood efficiently, which reduces the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. When the GFR drops, creatinine, urea, and other toxins build up in the blood, causing azotemia. In the tubular system, ischemia damages the epithelial lining, causing it to slough off in a syndrome known as acute tubular necrosis, or ATM. In intrarenal failure, the tubules and other renal structures are damaged directly, which often results in ATN. The damage may be caused by a disorder, such as glomerulonephritis, or a nephrotoxic substance. These substances include antibiotics, immunosuppressants, heavy metals, and contrast media. In this patient with ATN, the aminoglycoside, gentamicin, uniformly damaged the epithelial layer of the proximal tubule in the loop of Henle. Then, the damaged epithelium let the filtered toxins, or filtrate, leak back into the blood, causing azotemia. In post-renal failure, urine flow from the kidneys is obstructed in the ureters, bladder, or urethra. Typically, this form of renal failure results from renal calculi, blood clots, tumors, or an enlarged prostate gland. The obstruction causes pressure to build behind it, which raises the pressure in the glomeruli. This leads to glomerular dysfunction, reducing the GFR and causing azotemia. If you suspect acute renal failure, Intrarenal causes. These include conditions that cause direct damage to the renal tissue. Now, I might mention that in those pre-renal situations, if the, that is not reversed or corrected in a timely manner, that will produce intrarenal, okay, by virtue of damaging um, in an ischemic way the kidney structures. So acute tubular necrosis is the most common form of intrarenal kidney failure. The toxic damage involves the epithelial cells only. Okay, you've got a tubular epithelium and you've got a basement membrane. The beauty of the tubular epithelium is that it can regenerate. The basement membrane does not regenerate. So ATN can be caused, for example, by um, certain antibiotics and it can cause the tubular epithelium to just slough off. That sloughing can produce, um, they, then the kidneys don't work. They just won't work. They need their epithelial lining as well. Some things like ischemic necrotic uh, damage will also damage the basement membrane. And then the amount of function that comes back can be a little bit spotty. Okay, medications that are nephrotoxic, these damage the tubular membrane producing ATN 
or they damage the interstitial, interstitial, that's a typo, interstitial at the end, interstitial um, tissues, or they can damage the glomerulus. I'm not going to ask you to remember which does which, um, but these are some of the some of the medications that can produce this damage. The aminoglycosides include things like Tobra, Gent, strept, uh, Streptomycin, um, Amicacin, which we never give IV anymore. These appear to affect the tubular epithelium, leave the basement membrane intact, as does Amphotericin B. Um, Amphotericin B is a antifungal. Um, usually it's given with a, a pump for sure. It can cause some other problems and may require some premedication and some monitoring during administration. Cisplatin is a chemo medication. It's an alkylator-like agent. It's used for bladder and prostate and ovarian cancers. It's also ototoxic, which is kind of interesting. Many of the things that are nephrotoxic are also ototoxic, and that's, um, that's got something to do with embryology and the way that these tissues were first formed. They're, they're similar tissues, your ears and your kidneys. Uh, let's see, cyclosporin, that is an immune suppressing drug. Um, penicillin in some patients, but it's not, you know, it doesn't happen often. We use a lot of penicillin. Um, same with sulfonamides. You also have ACE inhibitors. Um, NSAIDs are pretty well understood to have the potential for um, renal, renal, uh, renal failure, especially if the patient already has compromised kidney function. Back to ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are important. They're actually protective of kidneys for patients who have chronic kidney disease, but there are certain situations where ACE inhibitors can produce acute kidney injury. Um, ACE inhibitor in the presence of low volume states can produce um, a certain kind of problem that will not allow the kidneys to be properly perfused and damages the um, kidney structures. Probenicid, lithium, heroin, these are also situations, medications that, um, well, I don't know if you want to call that a medication or not, drugs. Radiographic Contrast dye, that's why it's important for patients who have radiographic contrast to be adequately hydrated post-procedure. The incidence is negligible when renal function is normal. However, if the renal function uh, is already somewhat impaired, as in someone who has chronic kidney disease, then the incidence of contrast media producing kidney damage uh, goes up. If a patient has an elevated creatinine and or they are diabetic with diabetic nephropathy, then radiographic contrast dye can either be totally contraindicated or there may be an effort to protect the kidneys from that contrast dye using something like um, acetylcysteine, also known as mucomist. Now, when we use acetylcysteine for uh, kidney protection, it is not, um, it's not in an updraft treatment. Rather, it's given orally. It tastes like rotten eggs, so you mix it, you dilute it with um, lemon-lime soda, and have the patient drink it quickly and follow it with a bunch of other liquids to take the taste away. When we use it in updraft treatments, then it's just used to break up uh, respiratory secretions. Bicarbonate, IV bicarbonate, can also be used to protect um, kidneys from radiographic dyes. 
heavy metals, um, organic solvents. If you give the patient the wrong blood and the red blood cells hemolyze, the hemo 